Hey guys, uh, thanks for everyone who was able to make it out today. Hopefully you learned something, hopefully you had a little bit of fun, uh, and hopefully you got a chance to get to know each other a little bit better. So today we did a lab on, we were calling it Secrets and Ciphers, and it was basically just using Python in order to encrypt a message um, and then be able to decrypt the message. Now we didn't go into any crazy kind of encryption. We just applied something fairly simple called a ROT13 cipher um, that's been in use for many, many years uh, and is uh, not considered anything secure, but it was fun to do anyway. Okay, so I'm going to jump into my slides uh, if I can. Let me give that a try. Okay, there we go. So secrets and ciphers. All right, so... We talked a little bit about uh, what was a cipher, um, block for ciphers versus stream ciphers, substitution versus transposition, uh, and then we got into the lab. And that's all the farther we got today. Uh, that uh, took uh, an hour. Uh, most of it was, you know, writing some code. Okay, so some of these topics are a little heavy, um, but we tried to keep them light today. Uh, so what is a cipher? So essentially we want to take some kind of message we want to have a mechanism to take that message from being plain text where we can all read it and understand it into something that uh, is cipher text where uh, we don't necessarily uh, you know we can't quite understand what the original message what it was it basically hides the meaning right so that algorithm or that encryption that we're applying is our cipher so it's just a series of steps uh, that can be followed uh, to perform encryption or decryption, right? So take that uh, easy to read message and turn it into something not so easy to read and then also have something in place where we can change it back, right? So uh, there are two different approaches, block and stream. Block just being that, okay, maybe I have the entire message and I'm going to break that message into chunks and then I'm going to do something with those chunks, right? Uh, and so in this example, I have a 64 byte key and I'm going to apply that to maybe 64 bytes of data um, and, and do it 64 bytes at a time, right? Well, maybe I don't have the entire message. Uh, so we use the example of maybe we're watching something on television or we're streaming something from the, the web uh, and whoever is sending that to us wants to make sure that while it's being transferred nobody can quite see what it is right so nobody can you know steal your uh cable television i don't know you know whatever uh the point is is that you get pieces of the movie at a time right and so if that's coming to me encrypted i have to be able to decrypt it as i receive it and so those are stream ciphers right so I don't have to have the entire show or the entire movie. Uh, I just have it a little bit at a time and I apply a cipher to it as I get it, right? Now, today we primarily focus on substitution, meaning that uh, I take one letter and maybe I substitute it for a different letter. So in this example, I have an A, and every time I see an A, I'm going to replace it with a Z. And every time I have a Z, I'm going to replace it with an A. And every time I have a B, I may you know, replace it with an M and vice versa, right? So I have these characters that I'm going to substitute for other characters, right? And so... As we applied some of our code today, that's exactly what we did. Now, a transposition cipher um, may also rearrange the order that those are in. So, uh, if we use the example today that maybe I wrote everything in reverse. So, the first character of my message becomes the last character and so on and so forth. Uh, but it may be a little bit more intricate than that. Maybe my first character gets swapped with the 10th character. My second character character gets swapped with the fifth character, right? So I'm ma basically making these uh, out of order, right? To make it harder to tell what the original message was. Now, obviously, I would have to be able to do the reverse of that. So when I get the ciphertext portion of that, uh, I would take the 10th character and it would now become the first character, so on and so forth, right? So the two, again, different methods is substitution, which is where I know I'm going to, every time I see an A, I'm going to replace it with something else. 
Whereas in transposition, I'm also going to change the order, right? So in the ROT13, this was our Caesar cipher. So uh, lots of different ciphers have been used over the years. Uh, we typically associate this with the Caesar cipher. And essentially, I'm going to take the alphabet, alphabet having 26 characters, and I'm going to map that in a way that A gets moved uh, to 13 you know, characters to the right. So if I can get my drawing pad up here, um, hopefully this works. We are starting at A. So if I find an A, I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, wrap all the way around, and 13. So I end up replacing A with N, and I replace B with C, or B with, you know, this O down here. Sorry, I saw this and thought it looked like a C. Uh, anyway, essentially, I get a one-to-one -one mapping now where uh, the first tw uh, 13 characters get mapped to the second half of the alphabet, right? Now, one of the things that we'll have to take into consideration is what if I'm starting with X? And so I end up rotating, you know, one, two. Now I'm at the end of the alphabet, so I have to start back over three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And so my X becomes a K, right? So we'll need a mechanism in order to, hey, I'm at the end of the alphabet. How do I go back, right? And so we'll find that's actually fairly easy to do. Um, as we, you know, uh, develop our code out. So the ROT13 works very well because, again, 26 letters in the alphabet, at least in the English alphabet. And if we cut those by 13, all the first half mapped to, uh, map to the back half and all the back half map, uh, maps to the front half, right? So 13 and 13. So let's go ahead and jump into some code. And we'll kind of see some mechanisms that we have to put in place to make that possible. Now, there are two different ways that we can attack this. We can attack it by building a dictionary where that dictionary becomes our map, right? So every time I see an A, so in this case, I have, a, I have it as an A to an N, uh, whereas um, in my code here, well, I guess I did line them up correctly. So the A maps to the N, B maps to the O, C maps to the P, so on and so forth, down through the rest of the alphabet. Now, we could do that. It would get kind of tedious to do that for uh, potentially all the lowercase letters, all the uppercase letters. Um, and so I'm going to end up with a lot of key value pairs in my dictionary. Well, I don't feel like doing that today. Uh, I think it would be pretty te tedious for you to watch me type all of that out. So instead, we're going to take this second approach where we're going to apply a little bit of math uh, to the characters in order to, you know, do that ROT13 uh, rotation. So if we notice down here, uh, there's a lot of things happening, uh, but don't, don't get too afraid. Uh, this is actually quite simple. It's just we'll break this into multiple lines uh, going forward. Uh, so what we're going to find is that each character uh, has a number associated with it, right? And ord gets that order, right? So it's getting the ordinal value of the character. So this is like our step one. We need to get that value of the character that we're trying to uh, rotate. Then we're going to apply a little bit of math. So we're going to take that number. And we're going to find it falls into two different groups depending upon whether it's lowercase or uppercase. So if it's lowercase, what we'll find is that if we move 97 to the left, we'll be starting uh, basically from 0 to 26. Now we can apply our rotate. So this was like step 2. This is step 3. And now that we've uh, moved 13 characters to the right, we need to figure out, have we reached the end of the alphabet and gone too far? And so this is our modulus. So if you remember back from 
our uh, math examples we used before when we were first learning Python. I think we talked about modulus. If not, don't worry about it. This is remainder division, meaning that I'm going to divide by 26. And if there's a remainder, that's the number I get back, right? And so what I end up finding is maybe I was starting at the 24th character. I added 13 to that. This is now 7. This is now 37, right? So when I divide this by 26, what I'll find is 37, 26. This goes in one time. This gives me 1 and 1. So this gives me a remainder of 11. And 11 is what's going to be returned, right? And what I'll find is that puts me back in line with the front half of the alphabet, right? So that's good. And then because we started with taking uh, 97 off at the beginning, we're going to put that 97 back on. And that puts us back into the kind of uh, numbers uh, that we started with, that, those range of numbers that identify this as a lowercase character. So again, this is step one is getting the original or getting the ordinal value. Step two, we're going to subtract 97 in order to get uh, from 0 to 26. We'll do our rot 13 shift. So we're rotating 13. Then step four, uh, we ensure that we're still within the 0 to 26 uh, numbers, right? So if we go off the end of the alphabet, we end up back in the alphabet. And then we'll, step five, we'll add our um, 97 back in to put us back within the range. And then there's another step here to the right, which is really step six. And this is what changes it from that number value back into the character. Now, this looks crazy because it's all jammed together. But what we'll find is that if we spread it out in our code, it actually looks a lot easier um, than what it does, right? So I'm out of drawing mode. We'll head up uh, to our code. So this was hopefully your first uh, chance to see VS Code. It's a pretty good uh, editor. Um, we went ahead and first started out uh, by just doing a new file. Uh, I hit Control S in order to save, uh, or I can do a file and do a save right there, right? And so this is going to allow us to, to give our program a name. So we'll just call this rot. Uh, rot13.py. By naming it .py, VS Code automatically knows that this is a Python program. Um, and so it you know, typically gives me a little pop-up here to give me extra information. But the biggest thing it did for me is it made this little uh, play button here. And hopefully that shows up on your screen. But essentially, if I hit the play button, it's going to attempt to run my uh, script with Python. Now yours may give you some uh, pop up here in the bottom saying, hey, you know, we don't, uh, I don't have a program associated with this. If you have Python installed, there's a button on there to click and select uh, that you want to run it with your local Python. And then this should work just fine. Hitting the play button will run it with Python and you'll see that it executes it. Now there's nothing in our program, so executing it does nothing. So let's put something in our program. So we wanted some type of message to encrypt. So we'll say message equals, and we'll call our input function, and we'll say, give me some input to encrypt. All right? And so then we can print our message just to make sure that we did get what we thought we got. So I'm going to hit Control S to save. And then I'm going to come up and hit the play button. And now it prompts me, give me some input to encrypt. Now, let me blow this up just a little bit. Hopefully, that's a little bit easier to see on your screen. Uh, it's pretty big on mine at this point. But anyway, give me some input to encrypt. And I'll put, uh, this is my secret message. And so we saved off our message and printed it back out. So that was pretty easy. So we'll get rid of this print. 
So now that we know we have it, we're going to go ahead and encrypt our message. So we'll write a function. We'll call this def uh, rotate, right? And it'll take in a message. And we'll just, right now, we'll just return message. I must put a semicolon in there because I've been writing too much C lately. And we'll do a print on rotate and we'll pass in our message. So what we should see is that we're calling our rotate function. Our rotate function only returns the original message. So again, we should see something very similar to what we had before. This is a test and we get back, this is a test. Okay, cool. Well, obviously we don't want to just return our message. Instead, uh, we want to do something with it. So let's put output equals and we'll do the empty bracket. So essentially I'm creating a uh, empty list, right? So output is now a list. It doesn't have any uh, elements in it currently. And I'll say for C in message. So what I'm doing here is I'm wrote or I'm looping through my message. And what uh, Python does when it's given a string is it's going to wrote or it's going to uh, loop over every character. So C is the character in the message. And I can test that out by just doing a print C. All right. And so I'll get rid of this print down here because nothing is being returned currently. And so all I'm going to do is go through character by character and I'm going to print it. So what I should find is that I will get character by character uh, my test. So test message and notice here I do in fact get it character by character T E S T space M E S S A G E. Right? Too easy. So now we know we're looping character by character through our message. Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to get that ordinal value. So if I call the function ord, what I'll find, uh, and don't screw this one up. So I'm calling ord, so it has its opening and closing bracket, but it's nested inside of print, which has its opening and closing bracket. So you end up with two closing brackets on this side. So we had a little bit of a uh, little bit of issue with that today. Uh, usually when you've missed one, the IDE will know something is wrong. And so because I didn't close this bracket up here, it thinks there's an issue down here, right? So message all of a sudden has a red uh, squiggly line underneath of it, uh, noting that there's an issue with my code. It also turned the, um, the name up here red. So it knows there's an issue with this program. As soon as I put the bracket back in there, there's no more squiggly line and the colors for my file name go back to normal. So now this is a test. Now I get numbers back. Where did these numbers come from, right? So if you've never worked with ASCII before, what you'll find is that this makes, uh, you know, if you play around with it, it starts to make sense, but it's a little odd. Let me bring up a terminal here and I'll max this out and I'll bring up the ASCII chart. So we typed in T-E-S-T, -E right? Uh, or this, so T-H-I-S, and we got 116, 104, 105. 116, 104, 105. Well, 116 is right here, and that's the T. 104 is the H, uh, and 105 is the I, right? So what we're seeing is that each of these characters has a number associated with it. So we'll find that lowercase a starts at 97, and it goes all the way to 122, which is our lowercase z. So we know lowercase characters are going to be from 97 to 122. But our uppercase characters are going to be from 65 down to 90, right? And so as long as we work within those ranges, we know we're going to get the original characters back. 
So that's what we need to do is we need to start looking uh, at the various numbers associated with. So we'll say num equals ord, must have clicked off, ord c, right? And so now I'm going to be saving off that number and I want to do something, right? So first I want to check to see which range it's in. So if we'll say 65 is less than or equal to num, which is less than or equal to, and let me look back at my chart again. So we had 65 and we need to go all the way to Z, which is 90. So 90. And then that's for my uppercase characters. Uh, so I can now start working with that. So the first thing we wanted to do in our example was we wanted to subtract, oops, we wanted to subtract a value that would put it back in uh, basically down to zero, right? And so what I'm going to have is I want to take, if it's an A and it's 65, I want that to start at zero so that I know I have a number that I can work with and test against later. So we'll say num minus equals 65. And there I go with a semicolon again. Then the next thing I wanted to do was add my 13 in. So we'll have num plus equals 13. Now I need to test, did I end up off of the end of the uh, alphabet, right? So have I gone past, since we know we, we're starting at, Z, if A starts at zero, that means zero should be the 25th character, right? Uh, or should have a number of 25. So I need to do num percent equals 26. And this again takes it to if I've gone past 26, meaning I've gone off the end of the alphabet, what is the remainder? So uh, if I've gone off one, the remainder is zero and I'm basically starting at A, right? If I've gone two past the end of the alphabet, my remainder again will be two and so I'll end up at B, okay? So uh, let's give that a try. And then we'll have num plus equals 65. So this now shifts it back into the range of our uppercase characters. And so now we'll do an output dot append. And we're going to use chr. chr is going to take that ordinal value that we have stored in num and it's going to convert it back into the original character. So if I bring up my terminal here, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Python so we can kind of see this in action. So let's say our character is a T, all right? So lowercase t. And so let's get the ordinal value of our character. So that's 116. Well, let's let's actually start since we know the range of our uppercase characters. Oops, hit too many characters. We'll go ahead and do it that way. And so we'll get our ordinal value of our character and we end up with 84. So we'll name that our num. So we'll take num minus equals uh, and what did we have? We had 65, right? So now our num is 19. When I do num percent, or I need to add in my 13, so plus equals 13, I now see that num is equal to 32, okay? So it's definitely past the end of my alphabet. So if I do num percent equals 26, what I'll find is I now have six, right? Because 26 or 32 minus 26 ends up with six, right? So if I divide 32, oops, divided by 26, it can only go in one time. That would mean again, uh, I'm subtracting 26 from 32 and I'll end up with a remainder of six, right? 
And so that's what our num is equal to currently. So now I do num plus equals uh, the 65 that we subtracted from before. So num is 71. And so if I do a chr on 71, I'll find that I am now at the character g. And so if we look, if we look at our chart that we had, if we see our uh, t right here is in fact mapped to the g, right? So it worked, right? We went off the end of the alphabet by six characters, right? We went by six characters. So we went one, two, three, four, five, six characters passed, and we ended up at our G, right? So this was zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And so we end up at our G, right? So everything seems to be working out. Our chart, uh, we started at T, we went 13 past, and we ended up at our G. Now, hopefully that explanation helped. I'm pretty sure I messed something up in there. But the point is, is that our code seems to be working uh, correctly. So go ahead and exit out of there. And so we've done our 65 to put us back at the beginning uh, from 0 to uh, 25. We've added 13. We've made sure we didn't go past the end of our alphabet and we put ourselves back into the range of the original characters, and then we convert that character back into, uh, from that number, that ordinal value, back into uh, an actual character. And we're appending that to our output. So we're, we essentially go character by character by making these changes and then append the character back to this output list. So that does our uppercase characters. So if I highlight this whole thing and I copy it and I paste it here we can make sure we had our colon there which uh, indented us we have our colon here which indented us we had our colon here which again indented us but we want this next one, and instead of being an if, we're gonna do an L if, so else if, and we're gonna make sure that's aligned with the if, because we don't want this to be inside of this if statement, right? It's gonna be in line with it right here. So if this matches, we're gonna do these things. If this doesn't match up here, we're gonna test this one down here to see if it matches. But instead of these, uh, uppercase numbers, we're going to use those lowercase numbers, right? So if we bring up our ASCII chart again, again, we see that lowercase characters start at 97 and they go up to 122. So we need 97 and 122. We're going to make this 97 now instead of 65, this becomes 97. Now we're doing both uppercase and lowercase characters. Now the last thing here that we need to look at is an else. So if we've done uppercase and lowercase, we're gonna ignore numbers, we're gonna ignore um, punctuation marks, we're just gonna put those right back in, so else, we're just going to do an output dot append C, right? So numbers and uh, punctuation will not get translated, will not get substituted in any way. And so the last thing I need to do now that I've gone through each of my characters, right? So if I oh, close that out, I can slide up so we, we can see the whole thing here. So if I've gone character by character, I converted those to a number. If I needed to substitute, I've done the substitution. Otherwise, I'll just again append the original character back. And then I'm going to go ahead and return the results of this thing. 
So watch your indentation here. We had a few issues with this. I want to be all the way out here underneath the four. If I indent, it's going to try to return uh, the first time it gets through here. I want this to completely finish and then I will return. So again, make sure these are lined up and this isn't indented inside of the for loop. And here I'm going to do a return of, and this is a little bit of cheating, but I'm saying a string that contains nothing. I'm going to do a join on that. Uh, and I'm going to pass in my output. Okay. So what this is doing is it's saying for every element that's in, in this output list, go ahead and join it with this thing. And because it's there's nothing in here, what we'll find between each of the characters, it doesn't put anything. It'll just put it all back together in one string. Okay. If I were to put like a comma in here, it would put a comma between every one of my characters, which I don't want. Okay. So if we've now rotated that, let's go ahead and print our rotated message. Well, better yet, let's go ahead and save the results. And we'll call this CT, which is our cipher text. And then we'll print our CT. I'll go ahead and save. I'll click here to run. It says, give me some input to encrypt. My secret message. Notice here that we do get some garbage looking stuff coming out. So it actually rotated the characters. And so instead of a capital M, I got a capital Z. Instead of a Y, I got an L. But notice here, we didn't replace the spaces and we didn't replace the exclamation points. Because again, we only substituted for uppercase and lowercase characters. Everything else, we just passed along, right? And so now I have a way to uh, encrypt my message. Well, what happens if I want to decrypt it? Well, the beauty of ROT13 is that you can just run it right back through the rotate function and you'll end up where you started because again, the alphabet is 26 characters. If I rotate 13 and then rotate 13 again, I'm back at my original place, okay? So we'll do PT for plain text equals rotate message and I will print PT, all right? And so what I should see is that I will end up with my original message. This is my secret message. And so that did not work. Let's see, did I print the wrong thing? So I rotate, oh, all I did was rotated my message again. So really this ended up as CT. What I want is to pass CT in here, right? So this CT has already been rotated 13 times. And so I'm passing that in again to rotate it an additional 13 times. And what I should see is my secret message. And I do in fact get the encrypted version of it and the decrypted version of it. So now we have a way to encrypt and decrypt using the same function. So that's pretty much uh, where we called it today. That took us uh, about an hour to work through and troubleshoot some code. Uh, but uh, again, uh, rotate, you know, ROT13 is not a very great uh, method uh, for encryption, uh, but it, it shows us, you know, very easily, you know, what a rotate or what a substitution cipher looks like. This is about as easy as it gets, right? So again, we just uh, figured out where the characters fell, what range they were in, and we figured out that range by looking at the ASCII chart. We subtracted to, to bring us all the way back to the beginning, uh, starting at zero, all the way up to 25. And then we did our rotate of 13 characters. We tested to make sure we weren't off the end of the uh, alphabet. 
and then we put ourselves back into the range that we started with. When we were done, we took the uh, ordinal value that we had uh, worked with and we converted it back into a character, put that onto our uh, output list. When we were completely done going character by character through our message, we then took uh, and joined each of the elements of our list. So what was returned from this rotate function is a string. And we just went ahead and saved that off, whether it's CT or in the case of uh, running CT back through our rotate function, we ended up with PT. Okay. So very simple, short code, uh, but you can kind of see how this might be kind of powerful. Um, maybe if it wasn't ROT13, it'd be a little bit more powerful. But again, pretty cool stuff for not a lot of work uh, with Python. So again, thanks for uh, watching today. Uh, hopefully it was helpful to you. Uh, hopefully you learned something from it and uh, you know we'll you know pick it up uh, in our next meeting. So thanks and bye.